Hi, my name is Clint Rodriguez, and I am the gifted and talented and advanced academics consultant here at ESC Region 11. If you are watching this short video, it means that you are part of Texas Lesson Study and you are interested in pursuing uh, six hours of GT credit in addition to that which you will receive for being part of TLS. Um, if you're not part of TLS with Region 11, feel free to stick around and watch the rest of the video. Uh, there are a lot of great strategies and tools that uh, really everybody can benefit from. So, getting started, the first question that we need to ask if we are going to write lessons for the gifted is who are the gifted and talented? Luckily, the state of Texas has a handy definition of gifted and talented students that basically says a gifted and talented child is any child or youth who performs at or shows the potential for performing at a remarkably high level of accomplishment when compared to others of the same age, experience, or environment. And then it says a little bit more about content and skill-specific areas. I do want to focus a little bit on that underlying portion up above. We are talking about high ability kids who may or may not be high achieving. So we always need to keep that in mind, right? We also need to keep in mind that gifted kids come from all different kinds of backgrounds um, and there's no one kind of gifted kid. So that leads us to the question as we're thinking about how to prepare lessons for the gifted is do you know which of your students have been identified? as gifted? Um, do you know the, the identification procedure for your district? Um, and then on top of that, um, once you know who your gifted kids are, do you have a good idea of what their areas of strength are? What are they really good at? What are their passions? How can that help you drive some of your instruction? So you need to know who they are and you need to know what they are good at. Well, once you know who they are and what they're good at, you kind of have to ask yourself, so what, right? We're identifying kids. What's the point of identifying kids as gifted and talented? Well, the state of Texas also has a goal for identified gifted and talented students. We're going to focus just really on the first part of this paragraph. We want students who participate in services designed for gifted and talented students to demonstrate skills in self-directed learning, thinking, research, and communication. We're not going to worry so much about what it says down there at the bottom about professional products and performances. The idea is going to be that if we ask really good questions, if we engage in really good, rigorous, solid instruction, that's going to prepare these gifted kids to later produce those professional looking products and performances at the culmination of their school career. So we have a definition of gifted. We have a state goal for the gifted. How are we going to do that? Well, the first thing that we need to think about is kind of flipping the old model of RTI on its head. Um, tier 1 instruction is there for your truly on-level kids. And so once we've sort of figured out what our Tier 1 instruction is going to look like, then we'll move down and start thinking about the kids who are maybe behind, who aren't quite on grade level, or we think about the kids who are really struggling, you know, who are, who are maybe more than a year behind in terms of their content knowledge and their skills. And we very rarely differentiate up for our advanced kids or our gifted kids. So as you're thinking about achieving um, your goals of meeting the needs of your gifted students, as you're planning, I really want you to think about starting with your gifted learner in mind. Think about the most rigorous, the most enriched experience you can. How is it going to meet their needs? And then think about how you can scaffold that experience so that everyone, your on-level and your struggling kids, can get at least a little bit of the benefit from that experience designed for the gifted kid. GT curriculum and instruction, we're really just going to focus on four major things. The first one being acceleration. Are the GT kids able to move through the curriculum at a pretty good clip, at a faster clip when it's warranted? Um, we're not going to speak too much about that. We are going to focus more on two, three, and four, the depth, the breadth, and the, cur and the complexity of the curriculum and instruction that are being offered. Okay? Acceleration, um, your lesson should have a very clear 
means of pre-assessing. We need to know what the students already know, and we need to have a clear plan for responding to that data. All right? We can't really do the depth, breadth, and complexity as well as we would like unless we know what they already know, or if we have a good idea of what they've already mastered, or what they're very close to mastering, in which case we don't have to do too much direct instruction. So we need to know what they know. How you pre-assess is going to be up to you, but it is something that we'll be looking for as we're evaluating your lesson. It could be a pretest, it could be a writing piece, it really doesn't matter as long as it is very clear that you are pre-assessing and you're using that data to tailor your instruction. All right? So that's acceleration out of the way. We're really going to be focusing on depth, breadth, and complexity. Those three things, we'll use those terms kind of interchangeably. It really is about giving kids a, a deeper dive, more connections, um, playing with information and knowledge and skills in new and novel ways. Um, we're not going to get too far into the weeds of the, the difference that makes a difference between these three things. As we are moving through the next piece of this presentation, um, I do want to make you aware of the resource folder. Um, everything that I'm going to reference over the next few minutes is available in this resource folder, so I would definitely write down this URL, http backslash backslash bit.ly backslash rod gt resources. Um, bookmark it. Um, everything in there is uh, available for your use. Feel free to make a copy of it. Feel free to remix it, etc. Um, it's all there for you. So just for reference, that's where a lot of this stuff is going to be housed. Okay, so the first thing that we might think about as we are trying to build in more depth, breadth, and complexity into our lesson plans for our GT kids is something called a thinking triangle. And what I've done with this thinking triangle is I've mapped four levels of questions onto it. The thinking triangle concept was developed by Bertie Kingor, and the four levels of questioning um, were conceptualized by James Gallagher and Mary Jane Asher. So the first level of questioning, which is not to say the worst level of questioning, and we'll get to that in a second, is memory. Okay, The facts, the basic facts that kids need to have a command of in order to answer questions, in order to do deeper thinking later. So that's just a memory question, who, what, when, where, your first four of the kind of reporter's question, right? We don't want to skip over memory when we are teaching. We may want to spend less time on memory, but we don't want to skip over memory. A lot of folks will say, if you can Google the answer to a question, it's not a good question. I kind of say, well, yeah, sure, but think about how much time you save not Googling if you just know stuff, all right? Memory is important. Kids cannot be creative or think critically about facts and skills they don't have. So we don't want to skip over the memory piece. Who, what, when, where. Then we jump up to the convergent piece. These are kind of around the analysis level of a Bloom's Pyramid. So we're asking kids to kind of put facts together in order to come to a correct answer. That would be like a why or a how question. Again, that analysis level. Notice that I am framing these things as questions. Where you're really going to want to be focusing on adding the depth and complexity and the breadth is going to be in how you ask questions of kids and the kinds of questions you ask. So, Moving up from memory and convergent types of thinking and types of questions, we then get into the quote-unquote higher order skills of evaluation and speculation. So we'll start with evaluation first. Now that kids have a good command of the facts, now that they know how to answer sort of basic analysis questions, well now they can start to evaluate what they know. Is it good or bad? What's the best or the worst? Can we rank things? All right? What's the moral implication of this knowledge or this skill that we've just acquired? Okay. Um, again, you don't want to leave behind memory and convergent before you get to evaluate, and especially not before you get to speculate. I say that as a former English teacher who, and I'm sure if you're an English teacher, you've had an experience where you ask a child to predict what happens next in the story or to tell you why a character did what they did, and they will give you a beautiful, elaborate answer that has no basis in the text. Okay. Memory and convergent thinking those are the basis that kids need to be successful in order to think at a higher level. I always like to say that GT kids can definitely do magic tricks, but you have to give them the rabbit and the hat first, and that's your memory and your convergent. That's the rabbit and the hat. 
evaluative and divergent. That's the magic. So we've talked about evaluative. Then we get up into the speculative realm or the divergent realm, which is really where you ask kids, well, what if? Change some variable add something, take something away, see how that would change how they understand the facts. Okay, so by way of example, let's take a look at a memory question. It's not a trick question. In 1492, who sailed the ocean blue? Well, of course, that was Columbus. Kids just have to recall that. They know it or they don't. It's a little bit more interesting with a convergent type question. So an analysis question. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Why? And if you're like me, you learned the three G's in elementary school, gold, God, and glory. We've put our facts together to come to a correct answer. Why did Columbus sail the ocean blue? Well, because he was trying to find gold, he was pursuing glory, and he did it on behalf of the church, right? Um, you might bump that question up a little bit and say, well, what's the most important of those three uh, gold, God, or glory, just to make it a little bit more of an interesting question. But the idea, again, being kids are just kind of putting facts together in order to arrive at what's more or less a predetermined answer. Well, now that we have those facts, and now that we can answer kind of the basic fact questions, we can start to evaluate some of our knowledge. So in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Was that a good thing? Answer, most people will land on, well, it really depends on which side of the Atlantic you were on. It was great for Europe, but it was disastrous, of course, for pretty much everybody living in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, by the way, these are example questions for you as teachers. I wouldn't ask students to... to grapple with these Columbus questions, um, especially if they're younger. Um, it can be a little bit scary. It can be a little bit traumatizing. I'm only using Columbus by way of example for adults. This gets us into the speculative realm. We've done the memory. We've done the convergent. We've evaluated whether or not Columbus sailing the ocean blue was a good or a bad thing. So now we can ask a divergent or a speculative question. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Well, what if he hadn't? There's lots of different ways to think about this question. Um, well, if he just hadn't, maybe somebody else would have. Or maybe you could ask, well, maybe Columbus did sail the ocean blue in 1492, but maybe he was a nicer guy. Maybe he really was just motivated by exploration or making new friends or something like that. And in that case, a lot of bad things don't happen, but a lot of bad things still do happen because of stuff like disease. You could change this question around and ask, well, what if he had sailed a few years earlier, a few years later, etc.? Um, what would have happened um, to the civilizations and the society in the Western Hemisphere if they'd been allowed to continue to develop and evolve free of European interference? So those are some examples of how you would use the four levels of questions with a thinking triangle. Um, you know, make it specific to your content. Um, I just chose social studies because everybody knows the 1492 rhyme. Moving on um, to a little bit more complicated types of strategies, you have these depth and complexity icons, all right? These are um, visual anchors for different types of thinking skills. Students would use these different types of thinking skills to approach content and skills in novel ways. So on the left side, kind of there, you have the more colorful ones. Um, and the thinking skills that line up there, the lips are language of the discipline, the flower is details, the Z there is patterns, the uh, kind of org chart looking thing is rules, the line graph is trends, the question marks are unanswered questions, the diamond is ethics, the kind of Parthenon uh, temple looking thing is big idea, the, uh, the circle is change over time, the glasses are multiple perspectives, uh, the shapes with the strike through them is across the disciplines. Then over on the right side, the black and white ones, those are content imperatives, so you have origins, uh, contribution, convergence, parallels, and paradox. And these are all just different thinking skills, different ways of approaching content. So to learn more about what these uh, different thinking skills look like, you can go to uh, either in the resource folder or at that bit.ly dnc one p You will find a one-pager that has the icons. Um, it has a definition of the icon and the thinking skill attached to it. Um, it has some synonyms and keywords that you might also use. And then it has a higher level sample question for how you would use the icon to ask a question. Um, that's important. You have to pair the icon with a higher level question.
Um, and so there's some examples there. As well, there are some more resources, um, both in visiongifted.com and birdseed.com have a whole lot of stuff for free for teachers um, that helps folks integrate the icons into their curriculum and instruction. One quick way of integrating depth and complexity into curriculum and instruction is through something called a frame. It's called a frame, of course, because it looks like a frame. And what you would do is you would put your content or your subject, your topic, in the middle there. So I just chose a really abstract one, conflict, um, which shows up, of course, in social studies and social emotional learning and English and all of that good stuff. But really, you could put anything in there. You could put a multiple choice star question. You could put a formula. You could put a, uh, a picture or a graph or something of that nature. The content doesn't matter. You pick what you want students to uh, to grapple with. Um, so then you choose the icons that you're interested in, in the students engaging with, and then you write a, a question that's tied to that icon. So I've picked ethics and I've picked origins here. You can see the questions that I wrote based on those icons. And what I would do is I would, I would hand this frame to a kid and I would say, here's your icons, here's your questions. Write as much as you can about that question. Or I might just leave the icons there and let the kids kind of go freely off of the icon. Just tell me everything you can about ethics and the topic without a question. Um, you could assign different quadrants to different kids um, and use all the same icons. Uh, really, if you just kind of Google depth and complexity frames, you will find a whole bunch of different configurations and a whole bunch of different strategies for how to integrate these into your teaching. It's a very simple but very powerful tool um, for better thinking and better learning. All right, finally we come to the four parallels. All right, these are based on the, uh, the work of Carol and Tomlinson in the parallel curriculum model. Um, parallel curriculum model is a bit of a misnomer. It's not curriculum. It's just a way of approaching curriculum. And what we need to think about here is as we are teaching and as our students are learning, really the kids need to be able to answer five questions. The first question is, what do I know? Okay, what do I know about this topic already that's going to help me learn more about it? And there's another question embedded in that first question, which is, what am I supposed to know? And the answer to that is, of course, well, it's in the text, right? There are standards that tell us what kids are supposed to know. The second question, I think we also do a pretty good job of answering. Um, we know what kids are supposed to know because the state tells us, well, how do we know that they know it? Or how do they know that they know it? And that's the assessment piece. Is it a multiple choice test, a standardized test? Is it a project? Is it a writing piece? How do we assess whether or not they have learned what they are supposed to know? Where we don't do as good of a job, in my opinion, is answering three, four, and five. Okay, so if I'm a kid and I'm supposed to learn these things, I have a pretty good idea of where I can get the answer, you know, my teacher, my textbook, maybe my shoulder partner, but can I also ask what other resources are out there? What kinds of experts are out there that I could consult with to get answers to my questions? Four and five get really interesting. So four is what can I do with what I know? So I am a kid. I'm supposed to learn these different things. I'm supposed to demonstrate my mastery of certain knowledge sets and certain skill sets. Um, so what? How can I use these things in my daily life? What kinds of careers uh, can I pursue if I know this stuff and if I get really good at it? So really having a compelling and intriguing answer to that question as opposed to just, well, you might use this math someday, but maybe not. Right? We really do need to be able to answer that question, what can I do with what I know? And then finally, five, Okay, I, I've learned all of this stuff. I know how to do all of this stuff. I know what I'm able to do in terms of application, but what should I do? What would be the best thing for me to do with my knowledge and my skills? What's going to help the world? What's going to help my community? What's going to help my family? What's the moral or the ethical or the right thing to do with all my knowledge and skills? And asking these five questions is really all about getting kids from the beginning level up to the imminent level. So you sort of see that line down there. So the beginning uh, student is a student who really has not encountered the material before. They need a lot of help. They need a lot of instruction. But then that gets us up into the novice, where they can do certain things with guidance and help. Where we really want kids to start being, though, where we want them to get comfortable is at that practitioner level. 
where they can do it without help successfully most of the time. And really by the end of their school career, we want them at least in some areas to be an expert where they could, if they wanted to, teach others about that knowledge and those skill sets. Not that we want to make GT kids teach other kids. We never do that. Um, they're not our assistant teachers, but, you know, could they teach others? Do they have a good enough grasp on it? Or really, you can also think about expert as can they add knowledge to the knowledge they already have? And then finally, eminence is where they're, you know, past where they're past their formal schooling and they're really in their career, are they the kind of expert that other experts look to? So how do we get them from beginner definitely to practitioner while they're in our classrooms, but hopefully eventually um, up to that level of expert or eminent? So four parallels, five questions. Let's take a look at what those parallels actually are. Okay, so the first parallel is the core, all right? The core is the non-negotiable. The core is the text or the standards, AP, IB, whatever it is you're teaching, whatever level it is, the core you always teach. What do students need to know? What will be on the test? Or if you're thinking about it from a project or a problem-based learning standpoint, what must I know and be able to do to solve the problem? Okay, so you always teach the core, but then after you've sort of engaged with the core, you're going to want to think about adding in one of the other three parallels. The first parallel is going to be the parallel of connections. Uh, pretty simple. How does this content connect to other disciplines, other subjects I'm learning about, and how does it connect to the real world? Or if you're thinking about it from the problem angle, how does this problem relate to other problems? How is it embedded in other problem sets? Okay, so core to connections, you might choose to do the practice parallel with your students, which is really asking them, how is this content applied in day-to-day -day life? Or how is this content used by professionals? Are there certain things professionals do all the time? Are there certain skills they use all the time or certain skills they use less of? Are there certain things that professionals don't do because of codes of contact, co conduct? Or certain things professionals don't do because of... Um, ethical standards or, or political pressure um, and asking from a problem based uh, from a problem base uh, how would an expert approach this problem and then finally identity which is really okay how does this content impact me in my community how does it shape how I think about myself how does it confirm how I think about myself how does it change me um, what's the positive and the negative impact what's the moral and ethical uh, ramifications of this content and you know if it's a problem how will solving this problem impact me and the world so those are the four parallels okay so how does this apply to content well you've got your core here and I've just kind of come up with a sixth grade example because it's six right in the middle of K through 12 um, you have your teak over there your tech over there um, 6 ELAR 3B, Compare and Contrast the Similarities and Differences in Mythologies from Various Cultures. And then what I've done is I've asked a connection question, I've asked a practice question, and I've asked an identity question or sets of questions, okay? You might choose different questions. You might have kids come up with their own questions based on those parallels. Um, it doesn't really matter. The idea is just that you're asking solid questions based on these different kinds of thinking. I'm not going to read all of these to you here. Here's a social studies example from sixth grade. You can kind of see the connections that I made in terms of the actual connections, the practice, and the identity piece. Um, science as well. Uh, this is space tech. Everybody likes that tech pretty well. And then finally, math. Math can sometimes be a struggle um, for folks to see how they connect um, to some of these GT strategies. Uh, what I will say about math is that a lot of times, um, if you really think about uh, the conceptual mathematics versus just the algorithms, it gives you a leg up. And also look at those financial literacy and those process teaks. Okay, how do you actually apply these things? And that will give you... Um, some inroads into using the four parallels with mathematics. So one of the things that you may be thinking at this point is, okay, this is all great, but it's really hard for me to wrap my head around it. You're asking me to write these higher level questions. I don't have a whole lot of time. Well, in the resource folder, there are a whole bunch of different tools 
to help you do this successfully. Um, there's just three examples here. One of them is an inquiry-based learning one pager. Uh, then there is also a planning framework that integrates the depth and complexity icons with the four parallels with some of the thinking triangle questions. So as a planning tool, that can be very helpful. And then I've also got um, just a big old bank of higher level questioning stems that you could use um, for things like assessments, writing prompts, bell ringers, exit tickets, that kind of thing, um, to really kind of take some of the work out of it for you. Um, there's everything on there from just general stems to ELAR specific ones to some science Socratic seminars. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff in that folder as well. And it's all there for you um, to use as you see fit as you are trying to better meet the needs of your GT learners. Um, so with that, I will say um, if you have any questions or concerns, if you need some guidance or some implementation support, please feel free to contact me at crodriguez at esc11.net. I am more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, I'm so glad that you are interested in better meeting the needs of your gifted and talented and high ability learners. And I think this is going to be a really great learning experience for everyone. Thank you so much.